download this one. Dermatomes, it's a free download on your, it's really handy for working out which dermatome is affected. Um, those figurines move around, so you can exactly pinpoint which one or two dermatomes are involved. Scabies. Who's seen scabies in the last 12 months? Okay. Now, two or three years ago, everyone would have put their hands up. We're in a lull at the moment, there's not much around. So it's a seven-year thing. They've got a lot in South Auckland, apparently, so it's going to spread to the rest of the country. So uh, the incidence of scabies is unknown. I'm a part of a group in South Auckland, as it happens, uh, looking at the incidence of scabies. And one of the um, markers has been Pharmax uh, production of... Um, figures on permethrin sales. So permethrin is sold extremely much. You know, it's a cheap drug. It's sold in bucket loads. Uh, and therefore, there must be a lot of scabies around. Um, maybe. But actually, scabies isn't always correctly diagnosed. And we miss it. And we treat it when it's not there. Well, it's better to treat it when it's not there, because you, you don't want to actually miss scabies. So we suspect that the bucket loads of permethrin are mostly not necessary. So it's quite difficult to know how common it is. Um, my dermatologist colleague was part of a group that uh, went to a daycare for children, not old people, uh, and examined children with rashes attending this preschool. And uh, the nurses diagnosed one in three children as having scabies. The GPs diagnosed one in five as having scabies. And the dermatologist diagnosed none as having scabies. And I believe my colleague. I believe there was no scabies because I was involved with the photographs. So photographs were taken of the children with the rashes and they were sent to me as another opinion. And my opinion was none of them had scabies. Nevertheless, the group running this study decided that the nurses and the GPs were correct and there's a lot of scabies about. Um, that's because they were trying to prove there's a lot of scabies about and it's a bias, right? If you bias towards one thing, it, you can get it wrong. So what is misdiagnosed as scabies? Eczema. Remember, it, eczema affects one in three children. Impetigo. Impetigenized eczema. So impetigo is extremely common in South Auckland. There's a lot of admissions to hospital with, with um, skin infections at Middlemore Hospital. Some of them have scabies. The uh, actual part of the, why they want to diagnose and treat scabies is because scabies gets impetigenized too. And group A strep is in some of the impetigo, so some of them are staph, some of them are strep, some are both. If you have group A strep, you might get rheumatic fever, and that's a serious and expensive and life-threatening disease. So if we could get rid of scabies, we could get rid of impetigenized scabies, maybe we could get rid of some cases of acute rheumatic fever. Interesting study. Um, so the, the diagnosis is made by the presence of burrows, not by the presence of impetigo, not by the presence of itch. Two or more members of the family is helpful, but if you've got eczema, you've probably got two or more members of the family with eczema, so we need to think about that. And scabies can cause eczema, and scabies can be mixed with eczema. Uh, so it's pretty tricky. So the rash, highly variable, might look like folliculitis. This is an older person with scabies. On the palm of the hand in this older person with scabies, we see burrows. Not very clearly in this picture, but there's one there. We see pustules. Now, an older person's hand in a rest home, they're not doing any dishwashing. They're just sitting around. 
their palms should look entirely normal. So palm are involvement in an older person, very suspicious scabies. So how do we diagnose it? We use a dermatoscope. Uh, this is an older picture. I'm showing a, a picture of a mole on that. Uh, but what we're looking for is the burrows, and we look between the fingers, and we look on the rests. And if somebody's got bad scabies, it'll be on the palms. So I went to a rest home with a dementia unit. There were 25 people in the dementia unit. I put some gloves on, and I shook everyone's hand with the gloves on. And as I shook the hand, I'd say, that one's got scabies, that one's got scabies, because I could feel through the glove the roughness of the burrows. But that was an extreme situation. We want to catch them in rest homes before 100% of, of the patients and 99% of the staff, 60% uh, of the visitors, the visitors' families the schools that the visitors' families went to. <laughs> that, that particular epidemic, I think 1,200 people were treated. A school happened to be the school my children went to. It was a year after they left, actually. But <laughs> uh, they treated, I think, 2,000 members of the community for scabies. So we don't want to miss it. Uh, so we look for burrows and we use a dermatoscope and the cheapest dermatoscope costs $30. There's no excuses. What we're looking for is a wiggly line. And at the end of the wiggly line, a little grey dot. Has to be at the end of the line because that's the female mite. She's leaving her burrow behind. So she's at the end of the burrow. When it, it, so my registrars don't get it the first time. You know, I say that patient's got scabies. And they said, no, they haven't. I've taken a thorough history. There's no burrows. I said, well, I've used my dermatoscope. Uh, and they'll, they'll look at me with great suspicion because a grey dot doesn't sound very important, does it? There are other grey dots around. But this grey dot is at the end of the burrow. So it counts. Uh, eczema. Lots of different types of eczema. Basically, eczema is itchy, and it has a surface component. So an itchy rash that you can see has a surface component. So it's dry or blistered or scratched or something. We treat eczemas with topical steroids and emollients, and we avoid soap. It's that simple. Occasionally, it's infected, impetigenized. Again, in Patigo, we're dealing with staph, occasionally strep, mostly staph. Uh, and if those don't work, we're thinking about systemic agents. And prednisone is quickest and easiest and works quickly. By quickly, I mean two weeks. I don't mean three days. So if you've got asthma, a three-day course of prednisone may be all you need. But we're not talking about a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. We're talking about a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. This takes weeks to settle. So if you're thinking in your mind, this is bad, let's give prednisone. You're thinking of two weeks prednisone, not a few days. At full dose, 40 milligrams daily. So think again. Does that patient really need or want a drug with so many side effects and risks? Wouldn't it be better to use topical steroids? They work better, actually, but they need to be put on. And the problem with topical steroids is nobody puts them on because it says use sparingly or because it says, the, the, the chemist says, be careful, don't use that for too long. So they put it in the drawer and never even get it out of the drawer. So I want you to relearn topical steroids. Topical steroids are used liberally and don't worry about the side effects. Those take months to appear. If you want to clear eczema quickly, put lots on, heaps, just for a few days. Then you won't need it for months on end, and you won't need your prednisones very often. Okay, but the problem with our older population is they don't remember, and they haven't got help, and it's the middle of winter, and they can't reach their toes. So we have to get them help. 
And I, I haven't got the solution for help. In our region, um, district nursing will not put dress will not put steroids on patients. Uh, in some re in some regions, they will. Uh, we, a lot of people don't seem to have neighbours or friends or family members to do it for them. And that's a problem because we're not going to admit them to hospital just to do that. So we get people going to their local GP surgeries to have help putting on their topical steroids and emollients. Emollients. Emollients work. Uh, but they don't really clear inflammation. They're a support to the topical steroids. We need them to prevent eczema and to soothe eczema and to act as a substitute for scratching. You're so busy putting your cream on, you can't scratch at the same time. And to the avoidance of soap, soap is bad. What does eczema look like? Acute eczema is blistered, chronic eczema is dry. In between is just red and can be a bit blistered and so on. So many, many adverse effects to medications are cutaneous. So we call them cutaneous adverse reactions to drugs. They can be allergic or more often they're not. They're part of the physiology of the drug. Pharmacology of the drug, sorry about that. Uh, so often your reaction occurs when you start your drugs. So last week I had a dental abscess. Don't ask me about that again. It was hell. The worst days of my life last week. Um, I was given Augmentin. Within three days, I had diarrhea, okay? I didn't stop the old and I needed it. But it was an unpleasant side effect. But that's not an allergy. Augmental will do that to most people most of the time. Uh, in the skin, you can come out in various rashes, which are not allergies. You can get eczema, for example. That's not an allergy. Your hair can fall out. Your nails can go weird. You can change colour. The one we think of as allergy, although we're not sure if it is or not, is a morbiliform eruption. That means it looks like measles. Now everybody knows what measles looks like, I hope, and if you don't, you jolly well should, because um, we're in the middle of an epidemic. But it, it's a rash that occurs on the face and the trunk predominantly and it's formed of macules which are flat and papules which are bumpy. So a measles like rash is red face and trunk with little papules or macules. It's symmetrical. Measles doesn't occur on one side of your body, why would it? Nor do drug rashes. So both sides look the same. It can extend to the, the limbs as well, but tends to be most prominent. May or not, may not be itchy. And it peels as it resolves. So if you had your morbiliform eruption last week, you're going to be peeling. That's a good time to put moisturizers on to reduce the itching and peeling. 90 or so, well, no, maybe not as many as 90. Uh, well, let's say 80% of drug rashes are morbidiform. And they occur within the first few days of taking the drug. The most common culprits are antibiotics. There's no difference in risk from childhood to old age. If you've had it once, you'll probably get it again with the same drug, but not necessarily. And that's why there's confusion as to whether it really is an allergy or not, because you might not get it next time. And we know the circumstances uh, of uh, Epstein-Barr virus. So acute infectious mononucleosis, glandular fever. If you are given amoxicillin in any of its forms, you will get a morbiliform eruption. That's how we diagnose infectious mononucleosis. We give them amoxicillin, see what happens. <laughs> but that is not an allergy. So later on when their, infect their EB virus has gone into hiding, they can take the amoxicillin and not get a rash. Same happens in leukemia. Give somebody with leukemia amoxicillin, they come out in a rash. Give it to them later, they don't. 
uh, so it's a bit confusing. Can we tell the difference from measles? Well, we'll luckily, we've got blood tests to do that for us. But they don't have a cough. They don't have conjunctivitis. And they're not particularly unwell from the drug rash, mostly. But we'll come to some exceptions to that. So if you have, have a more biliform eruption that then misbehaves, and instead of not feeling terribly ill, you suddenly become very ill, you may have a scar, serious cutaneous adverse reaction. And that name is used because there's a bit of crossover between the, the, the three for forms. So I've only written two here, but there is a third one too. So S-J-S-T-E-N stands for Stevens-Johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrolysis. That's all one disease. They're not separated now. It's one disease. And drug hypersensitivity syndrome, which used to be called drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, DRESS. So they start with a morbidiform eruption, but the patient very rapidly gets ill. How do we tell the difference? Because they very rapidly get ill and because mucosal involvement. So the normal morbidiform eruption does not touch your mucosal surfaces. So you don't get a conjunctivitis, you don't get a, an oral eruption. So something like this is not a morbidiform eruption on its own. So this man has toxic epidermal necrolysis. He survived it. We had one uh, two weeks ago at Waikato Hospital, 27-year-old, prescribed carbamazepin, 70% skin involvement. His life expect his uh, risk of dying was about 70%. He left hospital entirely well because of expert intensive care management and because he stopped the drug very fast. So blisters, unwell, mucosal involvement, straight to hospital. Don't bother phoning the dermatologist. Get them to hospital. Urticaria, less common than morbidiform. Most urticaria is not a drug eruption. It was the infection that did it, not the drug, which is one of the reasons that people give an amoxicillin for their sore throat who come out in a rash are not allergic to amoxicillin. They're allergic to their sore throat or their viral infection. One in three people will develop urticaria at some stage in their life, so I'm sure some of you have had urticaria. Uh, there are various different pictures, but urticaria is defined by wheels. A wheel is not eczema, so there's no surface change. It's under the skin. Run, if you close your eyes and feel the skin, it feels normal. A wheel is a swelling that lasts less than 24 hours. So the rash can last longer, but the individual spot doesn't. It moves or changes or disappears. Um, the treatment is antihistamines, and I've written their response to antihistamines. Well, 85% do, not all. Bullous pemphigoid is a blistering disease, big blisters. So they're bully, not little blisters that you see in eczema. So eczema causes little blisters. Impetigo causes mixture of blisters. Um, herpes zoster causes blisters, but bullous pemphigoid causes big blisters. And it's due to the glue that sticks the skin together becoming unglued. It's autoimmune, so we have antibodies against the proteins in the basement membrane. We always do a biopsy. The reason we always do a biopsy is because there are other things that can look like it, and we're sentencing a patient to likely lifelong steroids and immune suppressive treatments. So we need to make sure we got it right before we do that. Uh, so if we've got a, an older person with a rash, we need to know when did it start. And sometimes that's really difficult to elicit from the patient or their caregivers. They've, there are all sorts of vague answers, and I, I don't know how we can train our patients not to say quite a while. And I have no idea what quite a while means. 
It's a bit like not very often. How often do you put that topical steroid? Oh, not very often. My doctor said to be careful with it. And then I discover that not very often is three times a day. But it might be three times a month or three times a year or not at all. Um, has it happened before? Is it itchy, sore? What helps? What makes it worse? Do you know anyone else? Take a history, especially diabetes, smoking. You don't need a history of obesity. That's staring you in the face. Alcohol, medicines, allergies. Examine the skin from head to foot. General principles, feel the skin. Is it dry, moisturizer? If there are blisters, don't pop them. What you're doing is introdu introducing Staphylococcus aureus. But sometimes you have to because they're so big that they have to be popped. Do it with a sterile needle, drain it, the blister, and then keep the blister intact except for your drain hole. The fluid has healing proteins in it. The skin has healing powers. The blister top is the dressing, but put another dressing on top to protect it. Uh, anything on the lower legs, we're usually going to look at compressing the skin, unless they've got arterial disease, to help healing. Um, don't tell someone not to scratch. It's really very unhelpful. They know that. They can't help it. You know, if it is, is itchy, you cannot do... If it's itchy, you can't not scratch it. The people who claim that they're not scratching are probably not itchy because you can't help it, you know, and itch has to be scratched. So uh, we have to think about strategies to reduce scratching, like cooling the skin, because cool skin is less itchy than hot skin, uh, like applying emollients to reduce dryness, covering the skin so it's less exposed to drying area, and figuring out what's the cause. We can't always work it out. Uh, I don't think we need to do any of this today. There was a, a, well, there was a time I became interested in the cosmetic side of dermatology. That lasted about three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these things, they don't really work much. They're all compared to tretinoin, which is a prescription medicine. Uh, and they'll say, this works almost as well as tretinoin. <laughs> mm. Sunscreen's important. Okay, this is showing that sun has an effect. So this, we talked about the difference if you're a driver. Uh, fillers. Fillers are quite useful for filling in defects. They're costly. Um, botulinum toxin is one of the most prescribed drugs on the planet. The um, various companies that produce owner botulinum A are uh, doing well, thank you. It's very safe, it's very effective. But you wouldn't want someone to do it who didn't know what they're doing. And unfortunately, there are things like Botox parties and uh, non-health professionals who somehow have persuaded some medical person to okay their purchase of the drugs, who don't know what they're doing. You can get blind if you inject it in the wrong place. But it's very uncommon and very rare. And most of the adverse effects from botulinum toxin wear off in a few weeks or months, luckily. Peels, mm. microdermabrasion, lasers, radio frequency, they all do the same thing. Take off the top layer of skin and it feels better. So my patient last week, he was only 27, but he had the toxic epidermal necrolysis. He looks 18 now <laughs> because he had a peel from his disease. That's rather <laughs> fatal. <laughs> yeah. Laser resurfacing, great results, nasty process, very expensive. Um, one thing I do uh, recommend is vascular laser treatments for um, red veins. Uh, they can work extremely well. So. Uh, good results from treating capillaries. It's an ongoing condition, so you have to go back next year and have some more done. Uh, surgery, not my thing. Maybe it should be. I'm, I'm growing old gracefully, I hope. 
so far. Um, yeah. Buy my book, by the way. <laughs>